Hi, my name is Bill Coltis and I was producer of the television series Art's Delight. Many years ago, Ian Sutherland was quite content to work in the beautiful European country of Slovenia. But Newfoundland beckoned and he returned to become the Dean of Music at Memorial University. Presently, he is Vice President of the Grenfell Campus in Cornerbrook, and in this retrospective interview, he highlights the role music plays in his distinguished career. Hi, I'm Laura Coltis, your host for Arts Delight. This week's guest is Ian Sutherland, the Dean from Memorial University's School of Music. We open the show with Ian playing a piano piece to show you that Ian is a lot more than an administrator. When we return, we'll show you the person behind the degrees. Welcome back. You may be forgiven in thinking that Ian is from a larger international city, but no, he's from Lewisport, and he explains Lewisport is not a bad place to be if you're musically inclined. I think growing up in Lewisport was a great experience. It was a fantastic place to grow up um, in terms of family life and a, a nice small but not too small community and so on. But even more so, it was a place that very much supported the arts, particularly music. Uh, it was a fertile ground for, for myself as a young musician uh, and other musicians as well. There's a, quite a large number for a smaller town of people that have come out of Lewisport that have gone on to at least study music professionally, um, some to, to go on to become professional musicians. So it was a great place with a, a lot of stuff going on in the arts, particularly in music. Yeah. Why did that happen in Lewisport? I mean, it never came out of a vacuum, I, you know. No, certainly not. I think. Uh, one probably can't come up with specific reasons why all these things always happen, sure. but the things that played into it were a, a good group of, of musicians that lived and worked in Lewisport and in central Newfoundland more generally who were involved in making music, who were involved in teaching music privately in, in their own homes and studios and things like that. Uh, so there was a lot of that kind of musical activity happening. Uh, there were some good choirs and churches, that kind of thing was going on. Uh, for Lewisport in particular, though, I would add the school system. So we had fantastic music teachers uh, through primary, through elementary, and junior and senior high school. And uh, that was a program that was started by a man named Rod Drover, I do believe, quite a while ago, uh, I mean, probably 10 or 15 years before I ever got into junior or senior high. Uh, he started a fantastic instrumental band program there uh, that just went gangbusters, <laughs> to yeah, use yeah. A, a pretty informal word. And uh, the teacher that followed him, or at least the teacher that I had, was Mr. Lindy Witt, and he had a fantastic band program in junior and senior high, so the junior concert band, junior jazz band, senior concert band, senior jazz band. Uh, great program, great music making, and we were always involved with performances at the school, but through festivals, we did tours to Ontario. There was just a whole lot of stuff going on. And I think because it was so successful, there was a huge amount of community support. So when I was growing up in high school, for example, uh, I think the, the concert band uh, achievements were just as celebrated as the hockey team achievements. So in, mm. in a... Well, that's saying something, I'll take that. In rural Newfoundland, that's <laughs> particularly, I guess, yeah, in the uh, 90s, that was saying something, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I'm always, uh, again, I'm surprised at these pockets of uh, uh, whatever criterion or something that develops. I vaguely remember a story from Ignatius Rumboldt, who was a choir director in St. John's a long time ago, mm -hmm. but they used to go on the Newfie Bullet, uh, they'd have the all of the stuff for the Pirates of Penzance, and they'd go right across the island. Yeah. So they'd slap in Buckins, and they'd do that show. Yeah. And I said, my God, that's amazing. Yeah. I think the university has played a huge role in developing the arts right across the province. Uh, so back in those days, yes, uh, Ignatius Nish Rumboldt was going out. Don Cook, uh, the founder of the School of Music, uh, used to do, do choirs across the province. He, and I think in those days, he probably actually flew out to Gander and then went to Grand Falls and did community choirs and things. So so there was a lot of seeding activity that happened through through the university for sure. Um, I think there are other institutions that have also played a big a role in this. For example, the music festivals, the Qantas and Rotary music festivals, uh, have played a massive role in supporting and encouraging the arts and bringing developmental opportunities for particular musicians uh, to smaller parts of the province that don't have the population density of St. John's. Uh, and yeah, broaden those development opportunities that would not necessarily have otherwise been there. So the university uh, institutions like like the Qantas and the Rotary Festivals have played a mass, massive role over the history of the province in developing music. Yeah, and I suppose in some respects that might be hard to, uh, when you're laying the seed for stuff, you don't see the results until 20 years down the road maybe, so it must be a bit frustrating, but yeah. obviously it's bloomed in Newfoundland for sure, right? It has, you know, we're a very musical province, Newfoundland and Labrador, and there is, of course, a tremendous amount of fantastic traditional music, what's often called trad music, uh, going on as well. Uh, and there have been institutions grow up around that, like the Folk Festival here in St. John's, uh, and other uh, festivals across the province and in rural communities in Fogo, in, in Lewisport, and other places. So those kinds of festivals and activities really honor, value, support uh, all kinds of musical uh, mm -hmm. explorations from classical to our traditional folk musics uh, and many th other things in between. Um, and you're right, uh, there's often a long game played on this and uh, mm -hmm. if I can stand on a, a soapbox for a moment, it's often easy uh, or thought to be easy to cut the arts in, in the school system or in a provincial budget if uh, if we need to save money uh, because you know in the short term you don't necessarily see the pain but if you go out longer term you would see uh, the yeah the the downsizing the the lack of opportunities over the longer period so we were very lucky that back uh, 40 50 60 70 years ago there was a lot of investment done by by the government by the university by communities to grow festivals and things that have paid massive dividends. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, when we were talking about trad music and classical music, I just remember seeing a performance by Stan Pickett and his daughter Angela, Angela mm -hmm. who was, uh, you know, she's a classical violinist and yep. goes all over and that's her career now, right? Yep. And uh, that's where it came from. Absolutely. Angela is a graduate of the School of Music here at Memorial, actually. and. Mm -hmm. uh, I, she's definitely based in New York. I think she might have actually gone to the Juilliard School she actually left Juilliard, here yeah, so. as a violist, and uh, yeah, and and crosses all kinds of bound uh, disciplines in, in music, from from traditional to classical. Okay. Hi, my name is Bill Coltus, author of the book, Revenge Finds a Home. The story opens up with a bird watcher walking through the woods and he comes across a body that has an arrow through its neck. Then enters Inspector Bob Lynch. It's a very complicated investigation, which goes from Newfoundland, British Columbia, Dakota, and down to Brazil. It's an intricate story and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. If you want a copy, you can go to Amazon, Indigo Chapters, Flanker Press, or any fine bookstore in your area. Music is truly an international language. At a very young age, Ian found himself at a summer piano retreat in Vermont. It was the first of many eye-opening stages in his life. When I finished high school, I actually went down to the United States, to Vermont for a couple of months and studied at the Adamant School, which is a school for pianists only in the hills of Vermont, and then came directly to Memorial University in the September after I graduated from high school to start my Bachelor of Music degree. 
I'm curious about the Vermont thing. Uh, was that a little bit of a, a bit of an eye opener? Was there, you know you're in a different culture, or a different country, yeah. and say, oh gee, I never heard that before, or they really accentuate the arts here. Yeah. Was it like that at all? Or? That was an incredible experience. Um, and it actually came out of the Kiwanis Music Festival in Grand Falls, the Central Kiwanis Festival. So that year, this was my last year in high school, I remember her name, it was Gwen Beamish. She was a faculty member at Western University, what then was the University of Western Ontario. Uh, and she was the adjudicator for senior piano that year. And so I played for her many, many times throughout the classes in the festival. And towards the end of the festival, uh, she took me aside and she said, Ian, you know, um, I assume you're, you're planning to go off and study music at university. I said, yeah, I'm planning to go to Memorial. I've been accepted and so on. And uh, she said, I think you should really come down to this school that we run in Vermont. It's a school mm -hmm. for pianists only. It was a school that was actually started, and I won't remember the founder's name, but the founder of the school was a student of Franz Liszt. And it brought pianists from all over the world, uh, from the United States, from Canada, but we also had pianists there the summer I was there from, from China, from Russia, and so on. Mm -hmm. And it was an intensive two months of piano only. So it was, it was eye-opening. Uh, I got to meet lots of pian young pianists from around the world, lots of performances, lots of master classes, working with some really cool um, piano teachers from, from Russia to the United States, Canada, and so on, uh, which also really set me up very well for starting in, uh, my Bachelor of Music degree here uh, about a month or so afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm almost, again, we're talking about seating. I, I know my father is one of the co-founders or co part of a group that got Kiwanis going. Mm -hmm. I'm just delighted over that. Uh, but uh, the effects of that, and also uh, we can kind of dovetail into, um, I always think about the sisters and choral music and mm -hmm. choir music in Newfoundland. And we just, Newfoundland seemed to do so well at these situations. Uh, this foundation was laid a long time ago yeah. and it's bearing fruit now. Absolutely. Uh, certainly in St. John's, the uh, Sisters of Mercy and the Presentation Sisters um, have made an enormous impact on the, the arts, um, music in particular, choral music. They were teaching piano lessons, voice lessons, all that stuff for many, many years in schools like Holy Heart of, of Mary, uh, which still today uh, has a very good choral tradition and singing and musical program at that high school. Uh, so they have laid, yeah, a lot of the foundations for, for the musical activity that's, that's come. And I'm glad that today we also have this more diverse viewpoint on, uh, on developing and, and valuing music. So it's the classical traditions, of course, but those are European traditions. So sure. also bringing forward our own folk traditions uh, and other forms of music as we become a more multicultural and diverse society. So the explosion of music, but it all goes back to there were foundations laid by people like, like the sisters that you've mentioned uh, that made music an important part of the fabric of our culture mm -hmm. uh, and, and also highlighted the fact that music was an important part of the fabric of our culture. Yeah. And Sisters of Mercy and Presentation Sisters still very much support the school of music. Uh, through through donations and scholarships and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, you uh, so you came to the school of music here and studied here mm -hmm. and you got a degree or a couple of degrees. Uh, yep, two degrees. So I first completed my bachelor of music degree uh, here in piano performance, um, and then I went out into the world of work, as it were. So I was working as a, as a musician, uh, playing, teaching. Uh, piano and theory and stuff uh, privately, um, working with choirs. I was, I was a gigging musician, which was great. Um, so I did that for a little while. And then Tom Gordon, who's a former director, oh, yeah, sure. dean of the School of Music, uh, I remember we, it was at a Christmas concert for the Festival and Chamber Choirs of the University. This was after I finished my undergraduate degree. And it was a Christmas concert for the choirs at the Anglican Cathedral. And I had just decided to go to the Christmas concert. And who should happen to sit next to me but Dr. Tom Gordon. <laughs> and so he and I, of course, struck up a conversation. And he said, you know, what are you planning to do with your life? Or some question like that. Tom's famous for asking very good, timely questions. <laughs> Uh, Tom's still a very good friend of mine today. Uh, and so we started talking about that, and I said, you know, well, I do want to go and do further studies, master's degree, and eventually a doctorate. And he said, well, why don't you do your master's degree here? I said, you can still carry on the professional work you're doing, uh, but come into the master's program. It's a great program. At that time, it was quite new. So I'd say I was in the second class or third class of the mm -hmm. master's program. So uh, I took Tom up on that. I applied and came back, as was accepted, and came back as a master's student. So I did a master's degree then in, again, performance, piano performance. 
And once I finished the master's degree here, uh, I decided I'm going to go all the way uh, without going back into the world of, of, of professional work full time. I decided to stay a student and uh, went off to do my doctorate. Mm -hmm. And where did you do your doctorate? I did my doctorate in England at the University of Exeter, which is down the southwest, about two hours by train southwest mm -hmm. of London, uh, in Devon, the county of Devon, which has very sure. strong roots to Newfoundland. Certainly, for sure. Yeah. And how did that go? Like, uh, was that again another eye opener? Uh, you know. Of Foreign music or whatever. Mm. Well, I d it was very much an eye opener because I, in a sense, changed fields of study. Um, <clears throat> when I finished my performance degree, my master's degree in performance, uh, I, th I I was feeling like well, I can play the piano fairly, fairly well. I was sort of happy with my ability to play the piano, but I had this long history of, of intellectual research kind of interests that I always wanted to explore and I thought well let's make a shift let's do my doctorate as a PhD a re PhD a research based degree as opposed to a performance based degree so my PhD is actually in sociology and philosophy a double PhD and uh, the fact that I went to the University of Exeter was in some sense, happenstance. Uh, so I had a conversation with my faculty advisor here, who's Dr. Cody Zago at the time, and uh, talking about where I would apply for my doctorate. And I kind of had the sense that I wanted to do the doctorate in musicology or sociology of music uh, and, and philosophy and so on. And she, she said, if you could study with anybody in the world for your doctoral degree, who would it be? And I stopped and I thought, Within five seconds, I responded, well, I would study with Professor Tia Denora, who had a uh, well-known music sociologist, written many, many books in music sociology, uh, big study on Beethoven in her early years, then she pioneered the music in everyday life approach to, to musical studies and so on. And uh, Cody Zago said to me, well, why don't you just get in touch with her to see if she's accepting new students and um, maybe that's the path you can go on. So I left. Dr. Zago's office, and I went to my computer. I Googled Tia Denora. <laughs> I love those stories. Yeah. I love them. And I found her address. I found she was at the University of Exeter. I sent her an email, and you know, 24, 48 hours later, she emailed me back. Oh my. And we started corresponding, and mm -hmm. together we put together my sort of application for doctor studies and, and applications for scholarships and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. about a year later, I found myself living and studying in England. coming back to Newfoundland fit into this, right. uh, this uh, picture? Well, that was a, a tremendous opportunity that presented itself uh, in a way unexpectedly. Um, so prior to coming in as the Dean of the School of Music, I was based in Slovenia, a small country in Central mm -hmm. Europe between Italy, Austria, uh, Hungary, and Croatia. Slovenia's right there in the center. Um, and I, I had been there for six years, and I was certainly not looking to leave. Uh, I was an associate, at that point, uh, associate dean for research and head of graduate studies, PhD program, uh, for a business school in Slovenia. Loved my job, fantastic colleagues, and uh, was kind of thinking, yeah, yeah, I would be there for a few more years at least. Um, and lo and behold, one day I got an email. As I tell these stories, I realize that <laughs> these major junctures in my life have all sort of happened out of the blue. Um, so I got an email from a search consultant that was working with Memorial University uh, on the search process for the next dean of the School of Music. Uh, and the email went something like, uh, Dear Dr. Sutherland, um, I, we don't know if you're aware, but the dean position of the School of Music at Memorial University is open. Uh, you are, you've been named as a potential candidate, would you be interested in, uh, in having a conversation about that, be, uh, whether or not you'd want to, to, to apply? Um, 
it literally came out of the blue. I mean, I wasn't sitting there waiting for an email from a search Things consultant. Things seem to happen like that to you, Ian. <laughs> yeah, but I think they happen like that to a lot of people. And uh, mm. I've had many conversations with people, uh, particularly like younger students, uh, about how do you how do you make your way in life? Uh, how do you uh, how do you find interesting things to do, sometimes they end up being successful. And one of the things that I've always said to people is be open to every possibility that comes along. And I think that's one thing that I've always done. I've always been willing to say yes to stuff. Uh, so I said yes to that email. And we, I had a conversation with the search consultant and uh, had a conversation with my partner, uh, who's in Slovenia, about this. And um, yeah, made the, dis the conscious decision I would throw my hat into the ring, as it were, to become the next dean of the School of Music. And um, lo and behold, about seven or eight months after that initial email, I got a phone call saying that I was the chosen candidate. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like coming back to Newfoundland now after? <laughs> uh, you seem so content in Slovenia. I was. I mean, Slovenia is a fantastic, beautiful country. Uh, beautiful in terms of its geography, its food, its culture, as well as the people. It you know. seems to support culture a lot, uh, music a lot too. Yeah, and when yeah, that's quite true of most European countries. I mean, mm -hmm. most European countries, uh, even European municipalities, s uh, support the arts more than the entire government of Canada. Uh, I don't want to get back on a political soapbox, but there's just more of a uh, intertwining of. Uh, certain forms of culture with daily life. So it's perfectly normal for uh, an average Slovenian to go to the opera, to the, to the symphony, uh, to the theater, whatever, on a mm -hmm. Thursday night or a Friday night. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, yeah, they do, there's, the, there's a massive support structure around that. Of course, we had to remember that all those art forms, opera, the symphonic works, etc., they all came from Europe. So in a sense, they're That's almost right. their traditional <laughs> music. Mm -hmm. So this is a very close tie. Um, but no, I was very content in Slovenia, a beautiful country, <coughs> was not looking to move. Um, but this was a fantastic opportunity and one that I've never ever regretted for a moment since. Mm -hmm. The School of Music just last year celebrated its 40th anniversary. So uh, in 40 years, the school went from zero uh, and, and in being founded in temporary buildings over by the Arts Administration Building, or what is now the Arts Administration Building, to this fantastic facility and went from a small cohort of six or seven students, I think were in their very first class, Imagine. to a school that now has uh, over a little over 200 undergraduate and graduate students. Um, so we've grown by leaps and bounds over those 40 years. As we've grown, we've grown a massive reputation in the country. So we really are seen as one of the leading schools in, in Canada. Uh, and we, indeed, we attract students from across, across the country. Uh, so a significant pr portion of our students come from the province of Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador, and that's part of our mandate as Memorial University to the province. Uh, but increasingly, we have students from across the country. Um, this, just this past year, we welcomed, for example, five students from Ontario uh, into, into the Bachelor of Music program. Uh, so we're recruiting students with, through our reputation across the country. And if you look also to our master's program, you'll see an even increase greater number of international students. So this past year we uh, welcomed students into the Masters of Music program, for example, from um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Mexico. Oh, fabulous. Ian, it's just, it's been great talking to you and it just seems like uh, this School of Music is in good hands for sure. Oh, thanks. Well, I have a tremendous uh, group of colleagues, faculty and, and students and staff to work with and we, we just do this together. Okay, well thanks for being on the show. Very welcome. My name is Marina Palmer. 
I grew up in Port of Swell, and I'm still living in Port of Swell. Came from a very large family. We had to cook to help our mother out. <laughs> she had that many children, so we were taught pretty young. <laughs> Every one of us can cook, I'd say, fairly good. I grew up, we had to take turns making our special cake for the weekend. Each one's sisters, one did a, a light one, one did a chocolate one, and then we we did molasses, what they call the old fashioned molasses cake, or like a gingerbread. We learned the old way that they used to cook. Meat wasn't easy to come by back in them days, so there was no fridges, no electricity. But the vegetables mainly came from our garden. Fish would have came from Port Spot. You go to the fishermen. I use my own olive oil. Now I'm gonna do a recipe that came back from great-grandmother from Quebec City. I'll keep stirring this now until it's brown, green brown. You brown your little bit of flour and make it nice and tasty. It was fish, you know, and a little potato and onions into it. I want enough of liquid to cook the fish, but I don't want too much. It was good. And we enjoyed it. Really did. My mom used to cook them. Oh, a master size pot. The recipe did come from Quebec. That's where my grandparents on my dad's side came from. My mom's side, my grandpa came right from France. At the age probably 14, 15, he decided he was going to get off the boat, so he jumped ship and took the boat and rowed ashore into it and hid away under a pile of lumber. And the man that owned the land, he came out that morning. Saw the men coming off the boat. He knew they were looking for someone. And he was hid away on his pile of lumber in the yard. So he took them in, gave them tea. And then he took them, then showed them where to go, where no one would find them. Down in Eddie's Cove, there wasn't very many people, probably three or four families at that particular time. So they took him in, and that's where he met my grandma, my grandmother too, and he married her. It's just something when you decide you want some fish, you want fish stew or fried fish or whatever, you know, you just cook it up for a meal. It's always made the same way that my mom used to make it and taught us to make it. It was a recipe that we grew up loving. about this program, 